Hello and welcome to another edition of One Question Each. Today is my turn to ask a question. So, I am going to ask you this. This is a very cosmopolitan newspaper kind of question, so it's very befitting that you have a, a pink pillow. Do you think that there is such a thing as an inherent middle age crisis? I have been living in it since I was born. Yes. Midlife crisis. Because, look, I am drawing it from this context. So we are living our midlife now. Yeah, Both of us, you're a little younger than me, but we're both in the same realm or generation. Mm. And everyone around us is also more or less in this range. We have younger, we have older, but they're all gathering around the middle. And whether there are people of affluence, of, uh, of poverty, of emotional stability, of difficulties, it seems like everyone is going through some sort of, like, sh I don't know, the shit is hitting the fan mm -hmm. from all directions. So it could be construed as Yes, the world is going through a big catharsis. And no, a big no, crisis. no, but there is, there is that. But there is definitely yeah. something in the middle yeah. age that is mm -hmm. a moment of consideration, of change of direction or whatever. So from your place of middle age, what are your thoughts? Hmm. No, there is... Okay, let's take two separate subjects. Mm -hmm. eh? One is the time in history. And then one is our individual life um, and within our lifespan. Yeah? So in the middle of your life, if you think of your life as an inhale and then an exhale, I think about this time is when we start to exhale. Yeah? Um, my, my parents, when were, they were here in Easter, and I had you and Iomi and my parents and my brother and his wife and his children and the dog and the cat and we were having this beautiful dinner. Your parents weren't here, but uh, they could have been, yeah? And then I was looking at the scene and I was thinking, this is the peak. This is the most I will ever have, at least in terms of the currency that is that matters to me, like the people that I love. From here on, people will die. Health. Not necessarily that your health has to deteriorate, but your strength will diminish and your flexibility will diminish. Mm. The time that is between you and death begins to be shorter than the time that is between you and birth. You realize that even if you were a point of reference, even if you were the Michael Jordan of your generation, <sighs> It goes away, yeah. yeah. Like it really. Pff. Um, so all that begins to be part of your daily life. It kind of weaves into your um, cosmology and your understanding of reality. The elegance with which you lose, and the grace with which you learn how to let go, will highly determine your contentment in the second part of your life. Mm. Yeah. Because all that you acquired, you never acquire, yeah? You, you just borrow. But when you're young, you're too busy acquiring. So even if you know this theoretically, it doesn't really sink. Mm -hmm. At our age, it starts to sink. It starts to sink that you're living soon. But I love the, the subtle effect that the clear, true, embodied understanding of impermanence gives to your life. I find, yeah. I find it very beautiful. Yeah. One of the examples that I give is if you had in your hand a beautiful flower, and they manage to put scent on it, but it's a plastic flower. And then there's the same flower, but it's a real flower. It's the one that is dying. 
and they might be able to replicate the flower to perfection. But the one that you know that is decaying and dying, it will always have um, inherent intrinsic value that is maybe hard to describe or explain, but it will, will touch us in a different way. Yeah. That means, I think, if you had not prioritized around um, your life's meaning and your understanding of transcendence, which mind and which heart you want to have when you die. So if those have not been priorities in your life so far, when you hit this point, okay, now, I'm, now is my life's exhale, then of course you have a crisis. But a crisis is a good thing. I don't mean a crisis has that. Maybe there's a moment of um, unsettling. Oh, it's, like a, it's like a wake-up call. Yeah, it might yeah. be, yeah. It might be a moment of unsettling. Mm. Um, but I think it's beautiful because if you are receptive to that moment, it will force you to look in that direction, to look in the direction of death. And in my experience, when I, I mean, I, I started doing that when I was a teenager, yeah, maybe even before, so it, it's not been a big difference. I, I do feel like I have always been in a midlife crisis uncertainty, unknown, unexpected. It's kind of like home for me. But in this time in history, something new is happening. And is that that initial part of your life where you would kind of decide what is your um, placement in this world? So you're going to be a shoemaker, or you are going to be a politician, or you are going to be a, a family man with a small business, or you are going to be a ballerina. And, and even if you would have had a couple of chapters in your life, let's say three chapters, you do this for a while, and you do that for a while, and you do that for a while. Now we have an issue. And is that we have to continuously adapt at the level of survival. And that is becoming very challenging because we put a lot of years in um, that specialization. Like if you become a graphic designer or a surgeon, you put a lot of years into that. And now you reach a point, and because the uh, technological development is so quick and is about to become crazy quicker. You're always kind of running after yourself. So I think there is a sense of generalized anxiety that we never arrive. So maybe it's this, these two coupled together like the general state of shakiness and groundlessness that is both viscerally and visibly and audibly present now, together with the, I say the midlife masses, because we're quite a few. I mean, there's a there's a increase in mental health issues, in suicide, in yeah. people that you thought were all together and that turn out to not be all. It means like it's not enough just to hope, but it's actually time to see how you shift. Like, so it actually asks for you to engage in a different way. Yeah, because I think the unsettling that we feel is not that you have to arrive and have everything under control. It's, it's almost the opposite. You want to arrive to a certain level of uh, functional simplicity. Mm. So you can actually dedicate attention to what is really important. Mm. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, it, it is important to wash your clothes and, and pay your bills and... Yeah, but to a certain extent, yeah. Yes. So, of course you can get confused and stuck in making more and more and more. But some of us felt like, no, let's just reach to a nice... I think maybe it's a feature of our generation. I think the previous generation had a hard time just staying at a certain level. But we saw our parents 
struggle and struggle. I don't know, yeah. just work for the sake of working, mm -hmm. yeah? So we decided, okay, like, I'm gonna go to, like, a nice minimum. Some people are a little above, some people are a little below, yeah? But some sort of relatively stable status quo in my life so I can dedicate attention to healing, to therapy, to spiritual awakening, to understanding nature, to spending time with my children, to developing hobbies, to, you know, all... From the mundane to the... Well, it feels to me like if we evolved from feeling scared about our environment and diseases and the weather, and we developed enough evolution, evolutionary tricks and technologies that we can feed ourselves and be more or less safe from the environmental dangers. Like from there on, you want to dedicate attention to the spirit, yeah? But now our generation, we had a moment there, like two or three decades, that that was possible. And now it's like gear shifted. Gear shifted, yeah. And now, once again, we are in this situation that the technological development, it's financial development, energetic development, all these um, almost automatic systems that we have placed that run almost by themselves and they're self-feeding. It's like they need to, because they need to grow because they are built by a mind that was very unsettled with accepting things as they were. So we have been continuously trying to escape from our circumstances into something that we think is going to be better. And we put the seed of that um, mental attitude into our political, financial, and te technological systems. So now we are serving it. And this is, and, and the last shift, this last really extraordinary shift in gear, which people have not yet realized, but it's gonna hit us very soon. Yes, I'm talking one, two years to see a world that is really different than the one we are used to, and maybe 10 years to see a world that is completely unrecognizable. So it's creating a, like, like you're floating, but the water keeps coming up and you see the ceiling and you're like having this sensation of anxiety because you're getting to a place where you mm, doubt if you will be mm. able to breathe. And I think we are simultaneously in the middle, if we are really optimistic, in the midlife crisis of humanity, mm. where we are forced to understand our incredible potential, but with more care to sustainability. In our lives, in the life of human evolution, we are in this um, bottleneck, very narrow bottleneck. But very exciting because the only thing that this bottleneck is saying is that that which doesn't make any sense doesn't make any sense. It's really self-explanatory. Mm. And I think that's what I love about it, because if you put in place any sort of system that is fucking stupid, that it neglects to respect and consider the environment in which that system is born, and the relationships that it has to the people, the beings, the animals, the plants, the ecosystems, to the future and to the past, if you have created a system that works very well, but is completely isolated from all those strings, that system, it won't work. It's, mm. it's stupid. Yeah. By definition, mm. that's the definition of stupidity. Mm. You do not see the full picture. You are narrowing down your, your view and, and you create something that is... It operates for a year, for 10 years, for 100 years, but it's, it's like... 
It's like if I switch on the fireplace with my furniture. Then I don't have furniture. <laughs> I don't know. It's stupid. Yeah. So we have done a lot of those things. Yeah. Yeah. We have switched on the fireplace with a lot of furniture. Yeah. 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 So we are in that. I feel that we are in that place, and we are in that place collectively, and we are in that place in in the history of humankind. But I do feel like this. I think that the um, the reason why, let's say, this midlife crisis, whether it's perceived from the an actual middle of your life or from the perspective of evolutionary history, in a sense, yeah. I think one of the things that make people go under now, when you say like, ah, there's a lot of people that go under now, be it to mental health issues, to physical health issues, to despair, to all the way to suicide, to, yeah, you know, all that. It's also this feeling that I think we grew up with a misconception. I think, I know I did, that I thought that you reach 50 and then you've like reached that, you have climbed the mountain and then it's like, you just float. It's just this, this like, ah, you have arrived and then almost like you're preparing for retirement, you're preparing for ease, for, it has nothing to do with financial sustainability. It has to do with that you have put certain steps in place in the same direction for long enough that it has created something that is sustainable, which is what normal people do, yeah. But I certainly haven't done that. I've gone here and then I did there. And then I wrecked that and I built there. So there's not that place of sustainability as I reach, I understand. But as I am maturing to that understanding and from physique to um, spiritual understanding to depth of clarity to the meaning of what the fuck are we doing here? is creating this necessity for engagement in a different way. But I do believe that the way that our culture and our society has been educating people in general, I think that is the reason why you reach this 50 and you're like, okay, I put in the hours, I did this, I did that, all these things, because you were sold that idea that from then on it's gonna be coasting. And then you get there and you're like, and now I have to not just like dismantle all my life beliefs, but I have to invest in a whole new like way of thinking, way of living, way of uh, like the disappointment that you thought that the luxury yacht was your future. And now you see that it's the giving up of all those things that that luxury yacht represents that is going to be your future. Well, the disappointment is because you compromised. Mm. Yeah. Because somehow there was something that was really fucking important for you. And then you decide, no, I cannot do this. I cannot spend time with my son because I need to put the hours in my business. I cannot uh, give attention to my parents or my spouse. I cannot give attention to writing the book that I wanted to write because I have to sell fucking toilet seats. Not that toilet seats are not necessary and important, but certain things that are important, maybe even essential for you, that you were completely connected with when you were a child. And then you cross some imaginary age for which we have no rite of passage in, in the Western cultures. And then all that is completely stolen from you. So you do what? Click buttons on a keyboard for <laughs> God knows what that you don't care about, mm -hmm. that you care the fact that it pays the bills, but your soul is not in it, your enthusiasm is not in it, your creativity is not in it. It takes so many hours in the week that you cannot spend time in nature, you cannot tend to your body. It forces you to live in a concrete jungle where you are separated from the breath of life and, 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 and the rhythms that we see around here, in the trees, in the ocean, in the, in the vegetation, in the animals. And you do all that as a ransom. So eventually you get this ideal last third or last fourth of your life. 
So of course, if that doesn't come, it's fucking disappointing. Mm. But even when that comes, I think what I see is that that comes a little later, yeah? Comes in your 60s. But by the time you reach 50, you've been doing this shit for like a long time. A long time. And you're tired as well. It's not, there's a long, another 20 years ahead of you where if, if your heart is not in it, it's just work. It's really heavy. Yeah, it's really heavy. And, and then I understand because it's really heavy, yes, if you have your villa and your couple of nice cars in the garage and. It your, feels like worth it. Maybe, yeah. yeah. Maybe you go sailing in the weekend or golfing or. Maybe. But even that is. That even when it works, you kind of have to look away from how hollow it is. You really need to convince yourself that having a new fancy watch is important. You pretend that it's more important than it is. And there I think there is a, a silent, invisible betrayal to who you really are and to what really matters that is supported by your environment by your colleagues, but it's not supported by your higher self because you have um, surrendered a fundamental part of you to the productive system. And I think that hurts people a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And to cover up for that hurt, you buy more things. But it's not enough, because a life without meaning and without deep intimacy with your true self in some way, it's like that's what we came here for. So you feel almost like the, the main purpose of your life is being neglected. If I extrapolate from anything in teaching, it's like, all is well. Mm -hmm. This is just perfect, mm -hmm. yeah. So I would say that there's a sense of this ease with uh, people have with themselves at times. But if all is well and if all is perfect, like then that can, that unconsciousness, it just, It can be wrong, right? I don't think wrong is an appropriate word for... Hmm. When we place as priorities not just survival, but an unrealistic expectation of continuously increasing comfort for the most part the satisfaction that we receive from that comfort is very short-lived which means that it requires a continuous upgrade of the level of comfort and that continuous upgrade of the level of comfort is unsustainable is unsustainable privately and is unsustainable in the big scheme of things as it relates to other people, to other ecosystems and to the natural world. So is it wrong to live that way? No. Could it lead to partial satisfaction? Yes. That satisfaction, is it sustainable both individually and collectively? No. The satisfaction that derives from a continuously increasing level of comfort is unsustainable. 
if in your soul's journey you are still at a place where you need in a lot of iterations, a lot of repetitions of the same kind of storyline until you wake up to transcendence, then you might find that in this lifetime you are able to maintain satisfaction for longer time through the increasing acquisition of material goods. But if in the evolution of your soul, if you're in your personal journey, in the amount of turnings of the wheel, you are a little closer to having understood that material satisfaction, it only reaches so far, then in this very lifetime, your dissatisfaction with material comfort will arrive earlier and will propel you in this midlife crisis that you mentioned before to really look at your um, relationship to the transcendent. So, when you extrapolate that to both the species, the civilization and its evolution through the ages, we have collectively arrived to that point where we can still find ourselves satisfied by watching a bunch of YouTube videos while we eat a chocolate bar in, in our third IKEA sofa that we have bought in 10 years. But that is unsustainable. And now we are forced to collectively acknowledge that it is no longer sustainable to live life on the planet with that attitude. Now, if I die tomorrow and I got lucky with my circumstances, I might have lived in a bubble inside the bubble where that was okay. Mm. Stretch that. And not stretch it either in time, but otherwise you can stretch it in space. Is my relative comfort satisfying me? Yes. <laughs> but if I extend my bubble and I see that the bees in my vicinity are getting extinct and therefore pollination is no longer happening the same way it was happening before and there are no whales in the ocean and there is no water because they are using the water for the golf courses and the avocado plantations am i satisfied in that experience of my own comfort while the species near me, the resources near me, the generations that come after me are suffering. Is that sustainable? No, that is not sustainable. That is not sustainable. So if I am enjoying that personally without seeing the crack that is producing in my life and the life of my environment, that is only due to ignorance. Is ignorance Can ignorance contain contentment? Temporarily, yes. Can it contain contentment and happiness in a sustainable way? Absolutely not. Is that wrong? That's a matter of linguistics. But wrong is not a word that I often use. But it's certainly unsustainable. And when one rises the panoramic awareness to consider your lifetime within the circumstances, your own and the ones that you love and the ones that you coexist with and the ones that you don't love, just the whole 
layer cake. It's self-explanatory. So, we need this midlife crisis. Fuck yeah. We need it personally, we need it collectively, the planet needs it. Um, maybe it's just that, maybe it's just the, the actual recognition that it's an actual crisis. Because if you continuously bypass the crisis mode, then you're just like not going all the way down, you're just like trying to... Um, to sugarcoat. Suppose, yeah, yeah, because if you live in the future, yeah, like you take time as, a, as this kind of like the, the rails of the train and you are just doing things so you, in your particular rail, get profit after the next station, mm. yeah? You are denying both that there are many more railways around, yeah? So you going very fast might not be good for the one yeah. next to you. And second, it's also denying the present moment. Mm. But if you go into the present moment and you just take care of your own pleasure in a, a radical hedonist way, you're also denying the way it influences mm. the environment. So mm. you are going to have to acknowledge the basic truth of the timeline and acknowledge the quantum truth of the now as the only existing reality. And you have to weave the two in some way. You have to weave the now into the forever. Okay, so <clears throat> more practically, let's say somebody is listening to this and does not come from uh, years of spiritual research or even interest in such matters, but they find themselves clicking on this button because they're having a midlife crisis and they're recognizing it such. What would be three key things Jesus, that you would, they have already acknowledged that there is such a thing as a crisis? There's a moment for transformation, for change. And if they look at this video as a source of what do I do, give them three key things that are fundamental and uh, will help the process along with what you perceive as certainty. Not certainty, that's a bad word, but with confidence. Hmm. Just three. Just three. Oh. Just three. Oh. And not too many words around. Okay, just, so just, just three. three. Number one. <laughs> Number one, what would it be? In your coffin will be you and only you and no one but you. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks, really, it doesn't. So you are on your own. For good Meaning own. you are free and you are responsible. Thank you. Two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two. Whatever comes out of the radical acknowledgement of number one, it's a life well lived. If the full acknowledgement of the fact that you are your own Buddha, your own master, your own judge, your own lover, your own friend and enemy. If you take that to heart and then you come with a response, I want to do A, B and Z. There are no rules in the universe. There's no right and wrong. God does not judge and tell you you are good and you are bad. That doesn't exist. You are God. So, also because the radical acknowledgement that is you, the natural second step of that will be to, to act. 
really dive into you and see what you really yeah. want. Yeah. yeah, because it's just you. You are not going to have validation by your priest or your neighbor from the second floor that you feel like she judges you on the elevator, in the elevator, or your wife, or your children, or your boss, or I don't know, the so. guy on CNN. So, whatever comes out of that acknowledgement that you are the only one that will be inside your coffin. That is a life well lived. And if you decide that you are going to dedicate your life to running marathons or to uh, study the penguins or to just, you know, like open a bakery and it doesn't matter because you will live according to your um, choices. And then number three, refine the understanding, the awareness of the previous two. Like refine it. Like what does it mean that it's you in your coffin? What does it mean that it's you? What is you? What is death? What does it mean to be alone? And the two you say, I want satisfaction by doing A, B, or C. What is satisfaction? What it is that you call to be satisfied? Because if you refine the understanding of what makes you satisfied, <coughs> you want love. You want to experience love. You want to feel love towards you, and you want to love. You want understanding. You want the universe to understand you, and then you want to understand the universe. You want to live in a spirit of cooperation. We are mammals, so you don't want to be in constant friction with the people around you, or the animals around you, or the plants around you. You want to be in a symbiotic relation of uh, collaborative empathy. So when you refine the understanding, so with, through whichever method you want, it can be meditation, yoga, thinking, walking and reflecting about life. It can be, there's a number of ways to apply self-introspection, but it will contextualize the way you understand who you are and the way you understand what you want and what makes you happy. And it will create that kind of continuous evolution that will make you forever feel like you are in that midlife crisis. But the, the word crisis mm, is a positive. Mm -hmm. I don't know. This is, I don't know. It's all born out of awareness. First of all, understanding this, what you said, you are fully free, fully responsible. And then who is this I that is fully free, fully responsible? What does it mean, this I? And then you get to introspection. And from introspection, if radical change is necessary, you do radical change. Or if just the slow glow of life refining itself through you engaging more through your awareness, introspection, but then it's that. I always say this, it's very simple, it's not very easy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, Especially, let's say we come into this from years of having had midlife crisis. I can only imagine if I would have woken up at like 45 and said, what have I done? The kids are all grown. I have this mortgage here. I have this work that is going to suck another 20 years of my life. I live in this circumstance where I feel like I'm hindered by everything around me. Yeah, but also, to change, like, I, I can't even imagine what that would feel like that day. But also, wait, because I had a nice reflection the other day. I was, because um, we are living in other variation of that. Like, we have other problems. Oh, that of is course, like, yeah, well, yeah. Life is a fucking mess sometimes. Yeah, but we way, never thought that the we other were problem-free. <laughs> no, 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 but the other day I was thinking, um, I think one of the sentences I might have said most when I was young was that I wanted a simple life. And then <laughs> when I look at my life now, fuck, there are days that it's really 
intricate and there's intricate emotional labyrinths that I visit and is weird. And, and then the other day I was thinking, I have a simple life. It's just that now I understand that simple looks like this. Simple is not easy. Simple is everything. It's like, um, you know, when you go to India and you buy something in a chip store and then they write 100% pure. It doesn't say what it's after. It's not pure silk or pure wool. It's 100% pure. <laughs> so I think our life is 100% simple. <laughs> it's natural. It's uh, fractal. It's stardust. And it's fucking bonkers. And it's I think the simplicity comes from the fact that you make no attempt from separating yourself from it. Does that make any sense? Well, I would say uh, may the midlife crisis continue to offer depth to us and to all of you. Um, always is like a crack in the eggshell. Yeah, it's a, the crack that allows that light to come in. So whatever kind of crisis we go through in, in the end, they are enlightening if we let them be. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Okay, friends. Till next time.